Our second speaker at the MACNA 2020 online seahorse and pipefish event was Chad Clayton of Reef Nutrition, covering his specialty, culturing, copepods, and breeding. Chad has been working as a professional in aquaculture for over 22 years, and his knowledge and experience working with copepods has earned him the nickname Copagod. In addition to playing a major role in supporting the Seahorse and Pipefish event every single year, we were thrilled that Chad chose to share his experiences at this event. In fact, I bet you would prefer that I stop talking and get right into this presentation. My name is Chad Clayton. I work for a company called Reef Mariculture. We make a couple of product lines. One is, is Instant Algae and the other is Reef Nutrition. Uh, many of you are probably more familiar with the reef nutrition side of our company, selling food, uh, you know, live feed organisms, copepods, live rotifers, and, and then, uh, you know, um, things like algae and brine shrimp and, and, our, and mysis shrimp, things like that for the aquarium hobby. Um, but a lot of those products are used by breeders, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and so it's really cool to have, you know, this crossover of, of products that we supply into aquaculture and the hobby, and, and a lot of people are just using them for, for many different purposes. So, so yeah, I've been with uh, Reef, uh, Reef Mariculture for, uh, yeah, a little over 12 years now. They brought me on board to uh, culture copepods. Um, Tim Reed, uh, 12 years ago, um, inter was interviewing me, and I had experience with copepods, and, and he said, you know what, this, these animals are the future of aquaculture. This is, this is an organism that people are going to need they're going to need access to it, you know, versus having to go out into the ocean, do a plankton tow, separate out all the life feed organisms you find, and then try to figure out how to culture the darn things and see if they're worth anything. Uh, and so, so a lot of people have already done all this legwork, and so we were able to, to start acquiring uh, multiple species of copepods. And, and this is a picture of me with uh, Tigriopus californicus. This is one of the most popular ones that we sell into the hobby. Uh, people primarily feed it to mandarin dragon nets, but a lot of people um, that breed fish, clownfish, and other uh, marine ornamentals use Tigriopus as a life feed organism. Uh, we even have people uh, feeding it, feeding the, um, these animals to axolotls because this species can actually survive in fresh water for easily 30 minutes. Uh, it can go from full salinity to, to straight fresh water, survive it for 30 minutes, and then be dumped right back into full salinity. No problem, no mortalities. Uh, you know, and it's just remarkable. So, so I, I grew up in Indiana, wanted to study marine biology. I got into the hobby back in 1988, got my first uh, tank, it was a 55 gallon and just fell in love with the hobby and knew that this was kind of where I wanted to go in life. Uh, and luckily I figured that out at an early age. Uh, you know, it didn't happen to me when I was 30. <laughs> so um, yeah, at age 14, after Jacques Cousteau videos, you know, shows and, and going to the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and getting my own my own marine tank, um, it, it, you know, it's it, that's where kind of it all took off. And and many of you remember the days of uh, under gravel filters and 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 you know, hay on the back filters were brand new back then, and it was just a, it was just a much different uh, world than it is now with lighting and filtration and knowledge and things like that. So so I went to Florida Tech um, when I graduated high school. Uh, Florida Tech is down in, in uh, Melbourne, Florida. Very good school for aquaculture. Um, they uh, collaborate with a lot of other universities, University of Florida, things like that. And, some, and these are some of my uh, mentors, uh, uh, Dr. Shank, doc, uh, the late Dr. Jindalin, and then Timothy Trekus, Dr. Trekus, who is a, a fish biologist. Uh, and then uh, a variety, variety of jobs after college, you know, working in freshwater, uh, you know, in the freshwater world uh, in Indiana, doing electrofishing, that was pretty fun. And just kind of keeping going, gaining more experience in the aquatic world, working with uh, zebrafish and in a molecular biology lab in St. Louis, Missouri at Washington University School of Medicine. This is where I really got my first uh, strong grasp of, of culturing rotifers, in vitro fertilization, stripping eggs, stripping sperm out of these animals and, and fertilizing them ourselves and, and raising them and creating different pigment pattern lines. Very cool stuff, fascinating stuff if you ever want to get into this. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge world. A lot of laboratories are working with zebrafish. So, so um, yeah, it's, it was really cool. And then uh, ORA, this was kind of my dream job was to get into marine ornamental so went to ORA back in 2002 and and just started working my way through all the species that were offered at ORA even new ones that we were bringing in while I was there I was there for four years and and towards the end of that four years I uh, started working with seahorses and just had a blast it was fantastic um, I, as many of you know it's it's amazing to just wake up in the morning and go check on your your breeding pairs and 
and study them and feed them and, and just stare at them. You know, I used, to, I used to have a rolling stool and I would just roll the stool along the tanks and, and look at the fish and feed them and make sure that they were, you know, they were healthy and the males, you know, were coming along with their pregnancies and everything was looking good and, and things like that. So um, that, that uh, ORA was where, you know, really uh, I got my first experience with copepods because I was growing um, uh, hippocampus, these, these seahorses with rotifers and newly hatched brine shrimp. And, and of course, as they aged, we fed them uh, enriched brine shrimp as the brine shrimp uh, went through their different stages of development, we were enriching them. Um, and so I, I didn't really raise seahorses with, with uh, copepods. It was basically rotifers and artemia and then weaning them onto frozen mysis. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, nowadays, gosh, people are using copepods left and right for seahorse culture and it's fantastic and there's a reason for that. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, yeah, after ORA, I, I was offered a job in, in Hawaii to, to grow copepods and work with broodstock, uh, Cereola rubiolana. Uh, the Almaco Jack, and, and I, I was like, no way, can I turn this down? And, and a lot of you are actually familiar with Ocean Rider. They were, they were right across the street from the farm that I worked at, uh, right there on the Kona coast on the big island of Hawaii. And it was really cool to see their like lava shrimp and their little ponds and stuff and, and tour their facility and, and see the seahorse breeding and, you know, kind of a commercial scale, uh, but, you know, in Hawaii of all places. So, so it was really cool. Um, and and that, that was my last job before I came to read Mariculture. Um, Tim put me on the Tigriopus californicus, which are the tiger pods, and these are some image of those images that I've taken of these animals. Um, this is quite a large copepod as far as non-parasitic copepods go, uh, and you can see here the females carry their eggs in kind of a, a sac that's kind of like a mucilage. It's all, all the uh, eggs are stuck together, the embryos develop independently, and then they hatch and become a copepod nauplii, which, uh, or a nauplius, which is a larval copepod, and then they go through multiple stages of development. And so these were all things that I was just basically plunged into, had to learn about the biology, learn about their ecosystem, try to figure out how to grow these guys. Because it's one thing to grow copepods in a flask and in a bucket. It's another thing to grow them in a giant greenhouse with 40 some 250 gallon tanks on a commercial scale. Uh, and the only reason why I can do such things is because I work for Reed Mariculture, who is a large scale phytoplankton uh, producer. We culture one, we're 1 1.5 million gallons of phytoplankton and zooplankton, and we sell our algae to a variety of customers all over the world. Uh, we are very much in, in, plugged in with the oyster and clam hatchery communities all over the world. They use a lot of our algae to feed to their larval oysters and clams, and as well as the brood stock and, and grow out and all of that. There's a, a lot of uses for the algae. Uh, and, and, you know, and a lot of people rely on reed mariculture because they don't want to grow the algae or they can't grow the right species or they can't grow enough of the algae or, you know, or they have a crash and, you know, they need nanochloropsis and, it, you know, these organisms, many of these animals that they're working with could care less if the algae is alive or not because uh, reed mariculture sells what we call non-viable algae. It is, it is not alive, but it is also not, you know, degrading. And so the cells are fully intact and we use temperature to preserve them. Uh, and depending on the species, like nanochloropsis can be frozen. And then isochrysis is a species of algae that can only be refrigerated because it has a more delicate cell wall. Uh, and, and so this is kind of what we do on a, on a large scale, grow multiple species of algae, sell them into aquaculture, shrimp farms, bivalve farms, uh, you know, uh, fish hatcheries that are using algae to feed to live feed organisms, which get consumed by larval fish. Uh, and, and then the hobbyists use our algae as well to feed to non-photosynthetic corals, bivalves, uh, and, you know, and, and also we have hobbyists that are culturing live feed organisms. So, so tigger pods is, is one of our, our most famous one and people actually culture these in separate systems. Um, they, you know, they, they put them in the reef tanks, they feed them to organisms. Uh, and, and this is an animal that has, is very rich in a red carotenoid uh, and which is a great antioxidant and a color enhancer. Um, and, and so Tigriopus californicus are very highly studied copepod if you go to Google Scholar and type in that species, you will see numerous research papers on their populations, on the environment that they live in, uh, the, the ecology. Um, that, you know, they're found from Alaska all the way down to, down to the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. It's a huge range. Uh, and, and you can imagine you know, all of the extreme uh, conditions that they're exposed to because they live in super literal, the supraliteral zone, which are these basically splash pools above the tidal zone. So it's a very harsh environment. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we work with organisms like this is because they're very durable. They can, they can handle 
you know, a wide range of salinities, urethaline, a wide range of, of temperatures, urethermic. Uh, and, and so we supply these animals in bottles. Um, we put roughly 3,000 uh, fully grown adults. There are some juveniles that make their way into the bottles and, and you see females with eggs and, and it's a great starter culture. Uh, and then this is another uh, copepod that we work with. This is a calanoid species, uh, Parvocalanus crassi rostris. I got these from Karen Britton out in Hawaii. Uh, and this is in fact the, co the, the same copepod that was used to get, uh, you know, for the yellow tang success and the hippo tang, the blue tang success. Um, because um, you can see there on the right side of the screen, that's a, that's a nauplius. And the nauplius of this copepod are incredibly small. They're, they're roughly between like 45 and 50 micron, which is a very ideal size for very small mouth larval fish. Uh, and, and of course, you know, these, these copepods can be fed to seahorses and pipefish as well. Um, but this one was very, very much important in the success of the yellow tang and blue tang aquaculture and, and many of the species that have been, that have, you know, been successfully raised in the last five, five years or so. Um, and, and, you know, this, this species is a more pelagic species, so we culture it in a different fashion uh, and we feed it live algae only. It, it doesn't accept non-viable algae, so we feed it live isochrysis and and isochrysis is a very good species of algae to work with. Copepods do very well on this algae, uh, even if you're not gonna use the blends that we work with for the Apocyclops or the Tigriopus. Um, you know, it's, it's great to grow live algae and feed it to these animals. They do quite well in isochrysis. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, you should look into that, that species if you're, if you're thinking about uh, working with copepods. Tetrasomus is another good one. Uh, and then some people will throw in a diatom like Catoceros. Uh, and, and so this one, this one is, is, a, is a fantastic copepod. We've been, I've been working with it for, gee, seven, eight years now. And, and we are a, you know, a source for uh, culture, you know, uh, backups. If your culture crashes, you can buy the nauplii from us. You can buy the adults from us. And in fact, this copepod, we have been able to ship the nauplii uh, around the world. Uh, we've shipped them to Turkey. We've shipped them to Thailand, to the Canary Islands. Uh, uh, the Marshall Islands, you name it. It's just amazing to be able to supply this animal to breeders all over the world. Uh, and, and the people in the U.S. certainly love us because we have clean cultures and, and we always have them available and we're able to ramp them up if we have large orders. So this is a, uh, this is the rotifer. You know, this is one of the most uh, popular life feed organisms in aquaculture. Uh, and, and, you know, people certainly feed these to larval fish like clownfish larvae and dotty backs and gobies and cardinal fish, things like that. They, they're, they're quite useful. Um, they're also useful in, in food fish aquaculture, cobia uh, and, and, and snapper and, and, uh, and the amberjack species, the jack species. Uh, so this is one that we also uh, provide and we provide it, you know, by, by the millions of animals. We uh, have uh, anywhere from 2 billion to 3 billion rotifers on hand at any given time uh, because we have people in aquaculture that, uh, you know, maybe got more fish hatched than they thought they would and or their rotifers crashed and they need they need rotifers so we ship them to them overnight they feed them directly to the larvae and you know and and they keep the operation going so it's really cool to to be able to supply those into aquaculture and into the hobby uh, we have a lot of clownfish breeders that use these uh so we're just going to get into kind of a little bit of the information on apocyclops panamensis because this is one of my favorite copepods uh, this is an image of a female um, we chose this species because there were actually some hobbyists that were using it. They said it was incredibly durable, uh, could outlast a lot of its contaminants. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with a contaminating organism, a ciliated protozoan called uh, uh, Euplodes. Uh, that's the genus. Um, and Euplodes can, can just destroy a culture very quickly. Uh, they thrive off of organic waste and, and, and rotting waste and, and poor conditions. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this is an animal that in, in, a, in a situation where you're not feeding it, it's relying on bacteria and, and maybe some natural algae that's growing in the culture, while those euplodes, well, those contaminating organisms, just, they can't, they can't keep up with this copepod, they can't survive these conditions, and so it can outlive its, its contaminants. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, cyclopoid copepods, which this animal is, is in that group, um, are actually known to eat ciliates. They're known to eat rotifers. They're known to eat mosquito larvae. Uh, I, I know some, uh, there's some papers about uh, Southeast Asia where they're using them to control mosquitoes, which is unbelievable. So, and again, this is a copepod that's non-parasitic. Um, it's primarily a, a, a benthic uh, copepod, but in culture, you will see them drifting around. You'll see it, it, they behave very much as if they were pelagic, you know, it depends on the water current. 
Um, and cyclopoids are found in, in a variety of, of, uh, um, of habitats. And, and they just, they're just a very hardy, very durable copepod that is very useful in aquaculture. People are already using it. Um, and, and so what our goal was is to, is to domesticate this animal and you know, have it adapt to aquaculture and, and our systems. Um, and, and like I said before, we grow, the, we grow microalgae and we put it in concentrated form so it's no longer alive. And so Tim, uh, that's the guy on the left there looking at a giant you know, uh, algae vat uh, before we bag it up and it's just remarkable how much algae we produce. I was blown away when I came to the company and I, I had seen a lot <laughs> before that. Um, but yeah, so Tim is like, you know what, let's, this, is, this sounds like a great candidate for non-viable algae. Let's see if we can grow it and then pass that knowledge on to fish hatcheries and, and maybe they'd be interested in working with it uh, because they don't have to maybe grow more algae or grow algae um, in, in significant quantities and, and you know, multiple species, things like that. So there's reasons why people use the concentrates. Uh, you know, it's, it, there's no pathogens, long-term storage, um, you know, no need to, to, you know, grow, you know, liter, thousands and thousands of liters of, of a certain species of algae uh, when you can just pull it out of, the free, out of the freezer, thaw it out, and start feeding it to your animals. Um, so so this, is, this gives you an idea of my culture room. Um, the, I use these, the 70-liter the black round tubs that a lot of people are familiar with, the, the horse muck tubs. Uh, and yeah, this is it here. And I just get these guys off of uh, Amazon and they're graduated, which is nice. They're graduated in gallons and liters. Um, so it's nice to be able to keep track of the water. Uh, and then my, my, my salt water backup is, you know, 35 parts per thousand for this animal. Um, I keep the water warm because I use it for water changes and rinsing like that. And then this is the product that I use to grow the April Cyclops panamensis, or I switch to Rotogrow Plus, which is another one. Um, and, and this one is very, very popular for people that are working with rotifers or even feeding to Artemia that are going through their stages of development. Uh, and, you know, it's a great algae species that has enrichment values, so it keeps those animals enriched. Uh, so the copepods eat the species of algae here. They eat the lipids um, and they grow and reproduce. Temperature, you know, I, I keep heaters going in the tanks, uh, keep the temperature around 26 C and then testing temperature every day. Aeration, um, this is... Uh, this just use a, a rigid airline. And then, oh, so here's some uh, sexual dimorphism of Apocyclops penamensis. You can see the females here have a very long, smooth uh, antennae, where, whereas the males have an, uh, articulations because uh, they actually will clasp onto a female before she's going uh, to become an adult. So while she's going through her final molt, the male will grab onto the female, hold on to her, and they, they actually court. He, uh, she gets the sperm, goes, you know, goes into her adult stage, and the copepods hold sperm packets, the, the females, and they fertilize their eggs as they need them. So it's kind of a one night stand deal with copepods, and then the male is like, okay, looking for the next one. And the female's done, and she's, you know, she no longer needs a guy in her life. Um, so, so it's pretty funny. Um, and then uh, Apocyclops panamensis, the females um, will hold the eggs in two sacs on their, uh, I believe that's the urogenital segment uh, on their urosome and the embryos uh, develop and hatch into the water column uh, and she will carry them around as, you know, until they hatch uh, and just keep popping them out. Um, this is a passive harvester. So University of Florida um, came out with a fantastic uh, um, article on these. Uh, basically this changed everything for me for copepod culture. Uh, I use these uh, devices to harvest nauplii from my copepod cultures so that they don't get too dense. Uh, and so, so the idea with copepods is to keep the adults or young or juveniles in a, in a culture and put these passive harvesters in the culture to strip out the babies, the nauplii, the larval copepods, and, to do, and doing this every single day. That way the, the culture doesn't get too dense because copepods don't like to get too dense. Uh, unlike a rotifer, which will breed itself into the into the next apocalypse, uh, copepods say, "Now you know there's too many of us. Stop breeding." Uh, and so this is something that helps to alleviate that. Um, and you know, Dean Klein did fantastic work out of uh, out in Hawaii when they were working on the on the um, yellow tangs, and and he you know he he discovered some of this stuff was very useful. And and so yeah, this is how I harvest the copepod nauplii. When I harvest the knops, I either sell them to customers that need knops, or I put them into a tank uh, the day that they're harvest, harvested and then raise them up. So it's a maturation tank. And then from that group of copepods that I produced, that's going to be my next rootstock generation, or I'm going to bottle them up and sell them to people that need copepods. 
Uh, and so this is, this is how we do it. Instead of having to harvest the whole tank and you know, size separate with multiple sieves and all that, these, you just pop them in the tank, put an aerator down and the airlift pulls the Nopoli into that column. They come right up the top and get deposited into that reservoir. And then I come back three or four hours later, voila, I rinse them out, I quantify them, I've got knobs. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic device and we're actually uh, working with a manufacturer to make these where he's got a 3D printer and we're gonna start manufacturing these bad boys so people can work with copepods and it'll fit in a five gallon bucket or one of these 70 liter round tubs. Uh, and we're also looking to make giant ones, five gallon size, five gallon bucket size um, for people that are in, you know, want to grow large scale copepods, uh, kind of like what we do at Reef. Um, and then obviously, you know, for all of you that are working with live feed organisms, you know, especially the small ones, rotifers and copepods, it is, I can't stress to you enough how important it is to quantify these animals, to count them, to look at them under the microscope, to look at them alive under the microscope, to fix, you know, to, to fix them with vinegar um, so that you can, so you can count them and quantify them. It's, I, every day I do this. I look at my copepod cultures under the microscope every single day. I count how many Nopalia I harvest so that I know how many I'm putting into a tank for them to mature, and then I know how many adults I'm gonna get out on the other end. Uh, and, and so this, this is just, uh, I, can't, I can't stress to you enough that how, how important it is to get a microscope to get some of these very simple tools, and you will spend some money initially, but these things will last for years and years and years. Uh, and microscopes are very cheap nowadays, you know, uh, 10, 10x magnification, 40x magnification, even up to 100x uh, is, is ideal. It's great. And then you can see here in the center uh, image, that's a Sedgwick rafter counting chamber or cell. Uh, and it holds exactly one milliliter of liquid. Um, and so you can do one milliliter um, subsampling, counting all your animals and then doing the math back to whatever your volume is. Um, and, and so this is, this is how we count copepods. This is how we quantify rotifers. Uh, and, and we do this every day. We do this before we sell them, all of it. So, so I, I'm going to try to motor through these really fast. Um, sorry, Kelly. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, these are the embryos of the Apocyclops panamensis. Um, I was able to get some of them to kind of wiggle a little bit and, you know, they, they, they kind of twitch. Uh, so it was really cool to see that. Um, and then this is actually, you can see the peristalsis in the gut of a, this is a later stage Nauplii. So this is an animal that's going to go through metamorphosis and start to look more like the adult copepod, the, you know, the images that I showed you. Uh, so this, is, this was really fun to get this. And then this is a couple different Nauplii. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, and so the one on the left is, is early stage, like stage two or three, and then this uh, one on the right is more like stage six before it's gonna go through metamorphosis. And you can see it, it's got the big fecal pellet in there and, and some you know, uh, lipid droppel, droppel, uh, globs and, and you know, things like that. Uh, and then this is another thing that, you know, you can look at your copepod cultures and say, you know, am I feeding them enough? And, and if you find these little mini sausages in your, under your microscope, then you know that you're feeding them enough. This is copepod poop, copa poo. Um, it's actually, they actually excrete a sheath over their, over their feces to protect their gut as the poo comes out of their body. Uh, because a lot of copepods eat diatoms, the diatoms are all spiny and, you know, pokey. Uh, and, and so they, they've adapted to that diet by creating like, it, uh, it's, you know, it's like a sheath, you know, it's like, a, it's like a mini sausage. Uh, and so it doesn't destroy them as, as they, as they go poop. So, you know, keep an eye out for stuff like this under the microscope. Uh, and then waste management, I use sponge filters. I used to use a uh, filter floss material. Sponge filters are great. I use very tiny ones. Um, and, and then uh, biosecurity is very important. I always have to mention this in every talk, uh, you know, Never ever share the equipment, the water, the stuff that you use for your reef tank and everything else. Keep your life and your organism separate. Keep your algae, if you can, keep your algae in a different room, you know, that your rotifers and copepods are in. Keep everybody separate. Never share equipment. Always wash your hands. Don't let anybody touch your stuff. Don't let any dogs into your facility. Dogs are a great vector. Um, you know, don't go to a public aquarium. Don't go surfing and not wash yourself and not change. These, these, the, I, can't even, I can't even tell you how important these kinds of things are because contamination can just bring down your culture. And if you've got a whole bunch of seahorses ready to go and you've got no copepods because they're contaminated, you're, you know, you're, you're done. You can't raise anything. Um, and so, so yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, then copepods are, are just fantastic organisms for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, people working with seahorses and pipefish, uh, this is just a fantastic life feed organism to feed to those animals. They are just, the nutritional value of a copepod is significant. It is it is immense. 
And, and so if you can get some copepods into your, into your seahorse fry, uh, you know, first thing early on, even if you're going to get them onto Artemia in a few, few days. Uh, and then of course, I'm always testing things, always looking for, you know, different ways to culture copepods. Thank you to everybody. I'm going to stop. That was, Sorry. <laughs> that was a lot. No, it was such great information, Chad. Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, for being here, for always supporting us, and for all of this very, very valuable information. And thank you to Reef Nutrition for the two awesome prizes they provided for our raffle. And, of course, sponsoring the event every year. The third speaker video will be out soon. And make your plans early to visit with Chad, myself, and the Seahorse community at MACNA 2021.